Welcome back everyone. Cube's live coverage here in Boston, Massachusetts, Red Hat Summit 2023, as well as Ansible Fest folded in. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with Rob Strecce, analyst breaking down all the action with me. We've got a great guest here, CUBE alumni, Ashish Bondi, Senior Vice President and the Chief Product Officer of Red Hat. It's just great to see you. We did a little preview interview. We were kind of teasing it out, but now it's happening. Welcome to theCUBE for here, big event. Great, thank you for having me back, John. Great All right, so a slew of announcements. Yesterday was the big day, the work day two here. A lot of stuff came out, a lot of Ansible heavy stuff in the front sure. end. Today's about scale, efficiency, and edge. We talked to one of your customers in the automotive area, mm -hmm. energy, open source is booming. What's your favorite announcement? Take us through the highlights. And give us the top, top announcements. Well, it's hard to pick your AI. favorite child. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do that. Um, you could talk about AI, right? You got to talk about AI these days, right? Can't have a conference without an AI conversation. So, so I think those were really good, good um, conversation to have. Um, lots of interest in that space from us, right? We we can see that clearly. I think what's fascinating to also see is the some of the areas that you typically don't expect Red Hat to be making announcements in that you know we made some uh, really good forward progress on. So, for example, developer experience. I think was great, right? Um, I've actually had customers come up to me and be like, wow, I was so glad to hear you're doing this work you know, off of the backstage project. We actually use it, and now I can go off and, and start um, uh, taking advantage of what, what Red Hat's bringing to bear. So I thought you know, the, the work we're doing on, on the developer side was fantastic. And then another area which I guess you know, most people wouldn't call sexy necessarily, but is so critical is on the secure software supply chain. I know you had Vincent Dannon come on, you know, talk about that as well. Uh, critical work, and it's work that you know we've been doing inside of Red Hat that we're now going off and exposing that customers. Well, Christian it. Uber, name's Uber, he's in the automotive area, it was <laughs> ironic, but he's one of your top customers, and he's doing an edge. He actually brought up that they're trying to enable bring your own foundation model uh -huh. into the automotive, and he highlighted the transparency of the software supply chain, it's one of the core elements. Right. This has been a big conversation in, in open source communities around the visibility, is it accurate? Right. The changing dynamic nature of what's in the bill of, of the materials for the code. Yeah. Why is it so important as a product owner looking at this down, staring down the barrel of this really important area? What's going on? What's the priorities? What don't people know about? Mm -hmm. I think the ability for us to you know, really dramatically reduce the amount of time it takes to start onboarding the application environments is huge, right? So if you say, wow, this, something like this took me weeks if not months to do, can I get this in days? Something that took me multiple steps to do, can I do it in a few clicks? Um, 600 plus lines of YAML code to onboard an application and, and, and bring it in, can I do that you know, in significantly uh, less time? That's our vision around, around that, so that's number one. Number two, once you've done that, on the other end of it, you're going to make sure you're you know, auto-generating, for example, software builds of material, SBOMs, right? You know, critical uh, for, for, from a customer perspective to do. And then be able to also incorporate all the other technologies that uh, companies find so valuable. So for example, we've invested uh, pretty heavily with others in the community in SigStore. Uh, be able to start incorporating you know, uh, digital signing and verification of the signatures, attestation and provenance of software components all the way through the supply chain. Um, again, it's it's plumbing work. It's the kind of work Red Hat does, right? This is the chop wood, carry water work that we do. You know, which we think is critically important that we can now make available to customers. Yeah. Hey, I think that that has been one of the themes that I've picked up on this week has been how do you make it simpler yeah. for people? I think coming out of KubeCon where uh, they're still doing a lot of YAML code up on their keynotes. Right. I thought it was great when, uh, during your keynotes uh, yesterday, where it was like, hey, look, no YAML for the data scientists, yeah. for uh, OpenShift data science, to then integrate in back into that platform and back in through Ansible yeah. to go and do that. Has that been really a big goal of yours, is that there's new personas coming into, especially at the platform engineering, yeah. as you kind of mentioned yesterday. Uh, is that like really one of your key personas yeah, that you're I think you at? caught on that real well, yeah. um, Rob, because uh, the point of, let's say, an Ansible Lightspeed is to say, yeah. well, you're stuck with the YAML, how can we make it easy so you can put in plain text and then yeah. get something back? 
right? You know, conversation I have with someone is like, well, can't I do that in chat GPT? Well, sure you can, <laughs> right? But now being able to give you something that's domain specific, <laughs> right, is much more powerful. <laughs> the next step that actually customers uh, are asking us about is to say, well, I've got a bunch of playbooks yeah. already built in-house, right? Large financial service customer, big Ansible user. Can I train that model directly in-house? So now we give you both, right? We give you OpenShift data science, right? You know, for, for our OpenShift AI, uh, solution for, for the MLOps platform, run your own model, uh, customize in, in that environment, and then on the other end of it, make sure that you can use it, for example, directly applied to areas like Ansel. Rob was uh, talking when last time we were in Vancouver for Open Source Summit about YAMLs in every demo, and yesterday he commented, finally, no YAML in a demo. Why is YAML such a hang around or when it comes to interface, and why does it take so long to kind of abstract it away? Because it, it's super important, yeah. everyone recognizes that, but then it's also like a lot of syntax. Like what's the, is there going to be an abstraction layer? Is it going to be voice? Is well we always do that, right? We always provide an abstraction layer, and then immediately people are like, wow, that's really opinionated, that doesn't really necessarily work exactly my mind what can I change or tweak? And the moment we say that, now you got to get away a little bit from the GUIs, right? Give yeah. people you know, access to CLIs, and then start tweaking the code. There's a balance to be had, yeah. and we're seeing that, you know, clearly customers have gotten comfortable with yeah. SaaS, but I think of that really more as end user applications. Yeah. The moment it becomes related to anything around infrastructure or backend, customers want some amount of Oh, they want to get in there, get in there too yeah. themselves, sure that that user interface is key. And, and we're an open source company, right? So yeah. our fundamental belief is, hey, code's open, you know, be able to use it. Hey, command line, it's the interface, <laughs> whatever your choice right. is, I get that. How about the developer hub? Because that was an announcement. I want to know more about that. What's the positioning there? Is that going to be like a single source of truth? What's, what's the positioning of it? Explain how you see that rolling out and yeah. being used by customers. Um, so, so that came to us via straight out customer demand. So, John, I know you were at KubeCon, right? KubeCon is when we um, announced uh, some upstream participation from us, right? In typical Red Hat fashion, right? Make sure we're going in, um, into the upstream in backstage. community. Yeah. Sorry? In backstage. In, in backstage, backstage. Yeah. yes, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So yeah. In, in backstage, right? And then, you know, once we can do that, now we can go off and say, we'll provide a distribution for you, and then we'll provide a set of plugins for you that'll make it easier for you to use a set of commonly um, asked tools from our customers, both within the Red Hat portfolio, but also um, outside that. Um, so we'll go through a period of maturation with it, right? Just like we've, you know, historically done with every open source project. Um, great, great example is Event Driven Ansible. First time we released that was a service preview at Ansible Fest last year. Yeah. And now it's got to GA. Get customer feedback, you know, get input, gets through maturation, then we'll take it out to GA. And I think, you know, we'll go through the same process with Developer Hub. I mean, I just ran into a couple of customers who said, hey, I didn't know if you knew. We're actually using Backstage, you know, so happy to hear you've got this, I'm going to start playing with it. Yeah, and what was the big attraction for Backstage? Um, for the audience not, um, that's not familiar with it, why is that, why are people liking it? What was resonating? And wh what's, where's the future going to go in your mind? Yeah, I, th I think uh, these are a couple of factors. One is, uh, with the pandemic, uh, distributed workforce, right? Developers were much more spread out than before, right? So you got, uh, distributed environments, and then also just a, almost a cognitive overload, you know, lots of tools coming their way. So one, how do you make sure, you know, teams that are spread apart can use something consistently? Two, how can you have a plug-in model that allows for new tools um, and so on to, to, to be burned to bear? And then of course, you know, do it in a way that, you know, people can feel like, hey, I'm, I'm you know, doing something that's accessible to me. It's being built by other folks with like-minded issues uh, and be able to engage in it. And so I think that's really how it started getting a lot of traction. Yeah, I, I think what's interesting is that and we'd had some discussions with some of the ecosystem partners as well, and I think it it brings that cloud-like development environment to mm -hmm. everybody. And I, I think that you know a lot of the clouds, they all have their version of it, and that's their control plane. Right. And almost a control point for right. keeping you in that ecosystem. Right. Have you seen customers asking for that? And I mean, you're everywhere. I mean, the open source is one, and you know, OpenShift is pretty much in every every place, including not just the big hyperscalers, yeah. but even the regional sovereign clouds and things of that nature. Has that really been a push? Well, actually it's both, right? So one is we obviously want to make it, you know, really easy to use with OpenShift, but you know, use it with other environments too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we made a similar announcement, for example, with uh, advanced cluster security as a service, right? So yeah. that's the technology we got via the StackRock acquisition. Use it via OpenShift, but use it in other non-OpenShift -Kub Kubernetes environments as well, right? So the ability to give folks choice and say, you know, use the environment that you're most comfortable with, but then we will support you, 
Um, and obviously, hopefully, the, the, the set of products that we're releasing, we want to make sure we have an integrated experience with, is a powerful thing. Service interconnect, right? Yet an example, right? Which is, you know, developers say, I've got application microservices, you know, in this distributed environment, these clusters running in, in all these different places, some of which are, are OpenShift, some of which are other Kubernetes environments. How can I connect those up? Right? And the OpenShift AI, that's really the generate, generate AI is for hybrid cloud. That seems to be the positioning for the OpenShift piece. To be able to run generative AI models yeah. on OpenShift AI, right? So OpenShift AI is the ML. So the analogy would be, uh, uh, back in the day you've got you know, a variety of different proprietary OS's, right? Now you've got Linux. Uh, back in the day you've got you know, a bunch of proprietary you know, Kubernetes distributions, right? Um, and, 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 and we brought to bear OpenShift. Uh, the same, for example, on the MLOps front, right? You're going to have a, a bunch of folks wanting to run, uh, you know, PyTorch, uh, uh, Kubeflow, you know, any any Anaconda, Starburst, a whole host of uh, uh, ML tools, frameworks, and so on. How about we provide them a standard foundation to be able to run run on them consistently, which is done in an open fashion? And the use cases there are what, for specifically um, with open Use AI? cases are are varied. I mean. We've got customers today, you know, just, just to be clear, who are already running uh, uh, AI ML applications, right? Uh, an innovation award uh, this year was given to Banco Galicia, right? Uh, what was that for? That was for running uh, NLP, right? So basically running natural language processing to cut down significantly the amount of time to open accounts, right, and do, do verification of that, doing that on OpenShift. The beauty is now, you know, let's give them a foundation tool to have uh, a way to use a variety of different tools, be able to do you know, model serving, model training, life cycling of them, and be able to do that consistently over a period of time. I have to ask you, as the product leader, chief product officer, you get the keys to the kingdom, meaning you got the engineering behind you, requirements for engineering, as well as customer, which is open source yeah. and end customers. So you got kind of like multiple front end stakeholders. Yeah. If, if you're asked, what's Red Hat's top three bets? What are you guys betting on? I mean, obviously open source has been the big bet, that's kind of standard. What are you betting on from the products going forward? Because as customers look at the, the, all the array of announcements, I mean, you got ecosystem development partners, so you uh -huh. got partner products integration, yep. integrating in, you got a lot of AI, you got a lot of blocking and tackling, chopping wood, carrying water, yep. you know, operating new, new news. Yeah. Where's the bets? What's the top three bets for yeah. Red Hat? Um, so we, we fundamentally stand behind our, our open hybrid cloud bet, right? Which is the notion of, you know, you have an abstraction that runs regardless of, you know, where you want to run it, right? You saw that, you know, in, you know keeping on investing, for example, in RHEL, making that available in, you know, um, public marketplaces from all the hyperscalers. Um, so, so we do that with that. Uh, OpenShift is made available self-managed or as a cloud service. You know, run that with any hyperscaler that you want, consistent add edge to that. So now you can say, well, is that a separate bet? Is that one, you know, extension. we can, you know. Uh, it's an extension. It's an extension, right? An and it's a continuum, yeah. right, for us, right? So okay, so now you say, well, our open hybrid cloud, you know, stretches out to the edge and make sure that, you know, we're providing that in a consistent fashion. Now, I think we feel pretty good about that. So that's one. Two, now you say, well, now we're doing all of that. I've got all these applications running here. How can I do that in a more intelligent way? How can I do it in a smarter way, right? That's where the AI uh, that comes in, right? We're not in the business of you know, uh, producing series of models, right? Let the hugging faces of the world and, and, and the others you know, do that, right? We want to make sure we are supporting that innovation. So I think you definitely will see us you know, have a play around that. And then we want to surround that with a series of services that are critical, both for developers yeah. as well as for operators in those environments. Right, developer experience is key. Right, so you yeah. see us, you know, for us to do that. Security, you know, is very important. You see us do that. Management, you know, is critical. You know, across that. Right, and so everything we can do to make it easier for you one to run that hybrid cloud, take advantage of the intelligence um, that applications can provide. You know, that's what we want to do. That's great. Thanks for sharing the uh, priorities. We talked to Matt yesterday. Uh, it was interesting. Was what fits in that bet was the conversation we had a panel with the senior vice president of IBM support professional services sure. and a customer. Um, interesting dynamic, the bet and the extension into the IBM piece is one, multi-cloud came up. So obviously yeah. hybrid, in your opinion, extends to multi-cloud, is that sure. in the same bet yeah. category? Yeah, I, Okay, 100%. so the other thing we riffed on, I'd love to get your reaction is, is multi-cloud multi-environment or multi-cloud as in stacks? So you got Azure, 
AWS, and we were trying to, and we were, it's nuanced point, but we, went, we were kind of riffing, like what is that, is multiple environments one thing, or multiple clouds a thing? Meaning, okay, I got Amazon, I got Microsoft, mm -hmm. they're different stacks, but in different environments. So it was kind of a, a, a point we were kind of riffing on, because on one hand, you could say environments are not multiple clouds. Yeah. Interesting point. I have to think about that some more. I, I, I think there's a lot of convergence in, 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 in those, uh, you know, between the multi-environment, uh, multi stack We've got to be careful too, because the, the moment you allow a lot of customization, we've seen this historically, and, and yeah. perhaps the yeah. perspective of you know, the, the person you spoke from IBM who's in the professional service business is a different one, because they'll support different choices. If we have too many places that choices have been made, now you're talking about you know, essentially having to support multiple distributions. There's only so many that you can do in a consistent fashion in life cycle. I mean, I met a customer yesterday, that, you know, we were talking about a 10-year uh, uh, enterprise Linux life cycle, and they're like, can, can you guys go further? We're like, well, we hold on a second. Aren't we doing DevOps? Can you? Can you? Can you? <laughs> Ten years, pretty good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, 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 we've got that challenge as well, right? We've got customers yeah. who want these long yeah, life yeah, cycles, yeah. and if you keep, you know, tuning everything underneath, well, we can't. Manage. Well, and that's a good point. When again, we were again getting to the same conclusion of it's nuance, terminology, semantics matter, naming, getting confused. But I think at the end of the day, we're seeing multiple clouds in a customer environment. Yes. And so you're seeing hybrid, certainly is one, won the day, grid check. Yeah. Now that extends out into the edge, and you're dealing with multiple environments. So again, sure. we stay with the environment term, but I mean, I don't know what you think, Rob, but I mean, this yeah. was, it's a nuanced point, but people are building the stacks inside the middle layer, so if they're on Amazon, and they have customers on Azure, they kind of do it under the yeah. covers. Yeah. yeah, and I think we had some ecosystem discussions with Stephanie yesterday, talking about how, and some of the others uh, across the ecosystem with Jeremy Winters was here yesterday as well about how it, it may be, hey, I have this stack becomes my infrastructure and here's the pieces I'm using from Azure that are Azure native yeah. and things of that nature, which I think it seems like that's where you're you're meeting the, that ecosystem and kind of looks like almost a mantra because even on the security side and the SBOM side, it seems yeah. to be that way as well. Uh, agreed 100%, right? And, and the, the relationship that we have with you know, hyperscalers like both uh, Microsoft as well as Amazon is critical in this. I mean, you're seeing them come yeah. and talk about, and I think you saw in the keynote too, right? They're talking yeah. about the long relationships that, that we've got yeah. with them. The ability to kind of work closely with them, that's the only way to do it. It's not easy, I'll say that, yeah. right? Yeah. Because, you, you know, Ruben we got to keep on doing stage. it. She's the head of partners yeah. with Stephanie. That yeah. was a huge relationship. You have Dell making an appliance. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty, that's pretty big news, right. actually. Right. The Red Hat appliance. Uh, right. 100%, you're right, actually. You know, maybe we didn't even talk about that a whole lot. But, but yes, <laughs> that, that's another one. And then you know, I met some other partners. They're like, hey, we want to be up on stage as well, talking about all the work we're doing with you. So making sure that we're not, at the end of it, right, yeah. spreading ourselves so thin that then a customer's like, well, I'm getting a yeah. suboptimal experience. I think that's really important. What's your message to the Ansible community out there? They've done a great job. Again, that community has grown and been thriving. Yeah. Uh, Ansible Fest was folded into Red Hat. The rationale there was yeah. kind of keep a, a bigger, broader piece yeah. of it, right? Keep, bring the products together. What's the product synergy? Obviously, pretty notable on day one. It's, yeah. it's Ansible heavy. Yeah. Well, one, automation is really important to us uh, because you we're seeing how important it is to our customers, right? Especially with our day one message about you know, becoming much more efficient. So, so, so that's critical. Um, related with that is we're keeping on adding capability into core Ansible. Event-driven Ansible is a great example of that, right? Hey, you don't have to necessarily pay us more. We'll just keep you know, building to it. But I mean, the, the, the third one, which you know, personally is really exciting to me, right? This is the part where I think of you know, AI as being magical, right? Yeah. Is doing things like light speed that really, really reduce the barriers for someone to use. I mean, Ansible is easy enough. I mean, that's one of the reasons why it's so popular. It's easy enough to yeah. use, but being able to essentially what I think of almost like a Khan Academy plugged right into a console, yeah. I mean, how amazing is yeah, that? Yeah. It's funny, we're going to look back at some of the Cube videos we did two years ago, a shash around. Ansible were like, this is the future. I mean, we yeah. were basically saying yeah. back then that they're going to, the Ansible users are going to end up ruling the kingdom. Yeah. Turns out that automation is actually crossing over mainstream. Right. Uh, share your perspective to the audience on how automation will unfold because it's not just automated configurations, that's easy, yeah. low, not easy, low hanging fruit, I should say. But where does it go next? What's the next phase? Yeah, great, great question. So, 
Before it goes next, what we also want to make sure is that all the areas they're releasing into start getting adopted, right? So that's been one of the big, biggest points of conversation I'm having with customers, because I said, you know, we're releasing all these capabilities, right? Whether it's with Ansible Lightspeed, whether it's with uh, automation, we're doing you know other works on, on AI and, 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 and security, right? We're doing much more work uh, for, for Ansible from a security perspective. I want to make sure that these capabilities are actually used. Because you know, someone in product, right, the thing that's most exciting to us is release something that's getting used, and if it's not, get the feedback across to us as to, hey, these parts are useful, the other parts aren't, right? So we can go back and then go off and iterate and, and change them. So uh, for me, from, from this point on here, it's like, hey, this Red Hat Summit released a bunch of you know, technology, hopefully got people yeah. really excited about that. Now I want to spend the time making sure users engage in it. Your momentum with Red Hat has been pretty spectacular. We've been following for many, many years, as you know. It's almost got that cadence of AWS now with the news. I mean, not Amazon's got a zillion announcements, but you're starting to see a lot more diversity and ap well, bigger aperture with IBM, yeah. bringing it together, more customer use cases. Yeah. You got a lot of products. You're like, what's that like <laughs> running the show over there? Uh, take us through the day of life. What goes on? How, is it going to get bigger? How fast is it going to expand? What are you expecting to see from a product standpoint? Yeah. Well, the good news is there's a huge amount of customer interest, right? So now the question is, how do we work substantially in areas to make a difference? What we've changed, I think, in many ways, is trying to get customers much earlier into a cycle. So I don't know if uh, either anyone from ABB or from... You just earlier today. You just came yes. earlier, right? Yeah. Yeah. Great example. Uh, both uh, partners, ABB as well as ATOS of Bosch, yeah. We've been working with them now for, for you know, many months, yeah. and the product that we're talking about there hasn't hit GA yet. That's going to do in second half of the year. We're just you know, starting to involve our ecosystem earlier on the process. I think that's really changed. You know, in the past, it was only open source community, and then yeah. you know, get the feedback. Now we're like, look, how do we actually get folks who are delivering value to their customers into and involved in this. You know this notion of co-creation earlier on. They're building on top of Red Hat. I mean, yeah. They had the Red Hat vehicle operating system. They're hardening the top to create more development sure. in cars. Yeah. So that's a mind-blowing example yeah. we had there. Yeah, yeah. and with the, eight, the, the edge genius out of ABB, yes. which was really good, because I've been in the oil and E&P part of uh, yeah. oil and exploration, and it was very interesting to hear them talk about because that's, you're talking about critical infrastructure as well. I mean, you had the life safety aspect of cars, but also in the critical Well, they're talking about robotic arms on factory floors, they're talking about wind farms. I mean, just, I mean, the yeah. amounts of use cases are, you know, phenomenal, yeah. right? You saw in the, in the keynote demo, the bottling plant, and how we can, you know, put that. Yeah. You got a great job. What can people expect from you going forward? What's your priorities? The folks watching, give a plug for your organization, what you guys are working on, what's on the roadmap, what are some of your priorities? Well, I'll start with, you know, we want to make sure we're staying true to our heritage, right? You know, it's three decades in open source, ensure that we are true to open source, we're true to the community, uh, helping bring that forward, right? So, so I think that's number one. I want to make sure that, that you know, folks don't, don't think, you know, as we're sort of, you know, expanding. Number two, um, there's a lot of different technology areas, and, you know, the temptation, right, especially from a product perspective, I think about if you ask me, hey, what keeps you up? Oh my gosh, will we spread ourselves too thin? Right, because you know we have so much interest in each of the areas, but but the question is, you know, you've got to be uh, uh, it's necessary and sufficient. You you you've got to be able to balance both. There's so of many those. great opportunities. Don't jump at too many of them. Exactly right, and so so how do we make sure that you know we're going at the right cadence? Like you want to be ahead of you know what customers want, but not too far ahead, right? And so being able to kind of balance those as we go advance our roadmaps. I think that's 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 super high priority for me. Yeah, and it's gro the growth is coming, and I think AI. Matt was Matt Hicks was pointing out that he thinks that the AI trajectory will match the trajectory of Linux, but much faster. Yeah. And he was on the quote yesterday. I thought yeah. that was the quote of the week, and I agree with him. I think the AI is going to have such an influence not only to Red Hat but the community. I mean, uh, we saw that at KubeCon, we saw it at Open Source Summit, and and. All the developers, they're, they're, it's another, another tool to them. They like it. Now we're like, we're like, okay, let's hold on. Let's <laughs> see how it goes. But good stuff. That's just, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much for having me Congratulations. on. Congratulations. Thanks, guys. Okay, CUBE coverage here. Day two, Red Hat Summit continuing. I'm John Furrier, Rob Stretch. We'll be right back with more after this short break.